Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me just start by thanking you and all of our staffs uh, for their, their hard work. Uh, we gather uh, to consider a long-term budget plan at an ex especially consequential moment for our country. As a result of the extraordinary actions that were taken over the last few years, America avoided a second Great Depression and is slowly emerging from the ravages of a financial meltdown and near economic collapse. While the economy is improving, millions of Americans remain out of work through no fault of their own and thousands more are facing home foreclosures as a result of their job loss. Our top priority must be a robust recovery and putting America back to work. At the same time, we must act now to lay the foundation for sustained long-term economic growth. Even before the economic meltdown, real wages for most Americans had been frozen for too long while families faced rising costs. Middle-class families have been squeezed. We must implement a plan to support small businesses, grow the economy, and ensure shared prosperity. That will require making strategic national investments to out-educate, out-innovate, and out-compete the rest of the world. It will also require developing and implementing a disciplined plan to steadily and predictably reduce our deficits and debt so we establish a strong foundation for long-term growth. Mr. Chairman, we all love America. We all believe America is a unique and special place and believe in American exceptionalism. The question is, how do we keep America strong, dynamic, and exceptional? On that, we clearly have different views and would make different choices. <coughs> we believe our strength springs not only from the undisputed benefits of a free people pursuing their ambitions and dreams, but also from sometimes harnessing those talents for important national purposes. We believe that America's greatness has resulted not only from a collection of individuals acting alone, but from our capacity to work together for the common good. We do not see the government as the enemy, but as the imperfect instrument by which we can accomplish together as a people what no individual or corporation can do alone. We all agree that we must act now to put in place a plan to reduce our deficits in a steady, responsible, and predictable manner. The question is, how do we do that? As the Bipartisan Fiscal Commission has indicated, any responsible effort to reduce the deficit requires a balanced approach that addresses both spending and revenue. This Republican plan fails that simple test. Yesterday, Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson, the co-chairs of the President's Bipartisan Fiscal Commission, stated that the Republican budget, quote, falls short of the balanced, comprehensive approach needed to achieve broad bipartisan agreement that necessary to enact a responsible plan, unquote. Indeed, the Republican budget is the same tired formula of extending tax breaks to the rich and powerful at the expense of the rest of America except this time on steroids and dressed up with what we'll hear is a lot of nice sweet talk about reform that masks the damage that this budget will do. To govern is to choose, and the choices made in the Republican budget are wrong for America. It is not courageous to protect tax giveaways to big oil companies and other special interests while slashing investments in our kids' education in scientific research and critical infrastructure. It is not bold to provide tax breaks to millionaires while ending the Medicare guarantee for seniors and sticking seniors with the bill for rising health care costs. It is not visionary to reward corporations that ship American jobs overseas while terminating affordable health care for tens of millions of Americans. It is not brave to give governors a blank check for their pet initiatives and a license to cut support for seniors in nursing homes, individuals with disabilities, and low-income kids. And it is not fair to raise taxes on middle-income Americans to pay for big additional tax breaks for the very wealthy. Yet those are the choices made in the Republican budget. Where is the shared sacrifice? We have American men and women putting their lives on the line in Iraq and Afghanistan 
while others hide their income in the Cayman Islands and Switzerland and refuse to pay their fair share to support our nation. The Bipartisan Fiscal Commission called upon all Americans to pay their fair share. Its budget blueprint calls for the top 2% income earners to pay the same tax rates they paid during the booming economy of the Clinton administration. Their plan also generates another $1 trillion in revenue over 10 years by closing special interest tax loopholes and limiting tax expenditures. The Fiscal Commission also warned that very deep, immediate cuts would threaten the fragile economic recovery and slow job growth. They also recognized that America must make strategic investments to win in the global marketplace. The Republican budget fails both the and I would say that the jobs numbers we heard cited came from an analysis done by the Heritage Foundation, the same organization that predicted that the Bush tax cuts of 2001, 2003 would lead to booming job growth when we know at the end of that eight-year period we had actually lost over 600,000 private sector jobs in America. Make no mistake, significant and sustained spending cuts must be part of any balanced plan to reduce the deficit. But America has become an economic powerhouse in part because of the targeted strategic investments made by earlier generations, including huge investments in science and technology, the interstate highway system, and educational opportunities for our people. Now, at the very moment, the very moment that our global competitors are copying our successful model, this budget would take America back. Now let me turn to the question of health care. Every member of this committee knows that rising health care costs represent a huge challenge for the federal budget. But every member of this committee also knows what the experts have told us, that those rising costs are not unique to Medicare and Medicaid. Those costs are endemic to the entire health care system. In fact, for 30 years, the per beneficiary spending in Medicare and Medicaid has grown at virtually the same rate as those of the overall health care system. And over the last decade, the per beneficiary cost of Medicaid actually grew more slowly than the rest of the health care system. By contrast, in the private market for individual coverage, premiums more than doubled between the years 2000 and 2008. Those facts make one thing clear. If we're going to slow the rising costs in the Medicare and Medicaid without rationing care, we must slow the rising costs of health care throughout the health care system. And that is exactly what the Affordable Care Act is designed to do and will do when fully implemented. The Affordable Care Act will begin to bring down the per capita health care costs throughout the system, including Medicare. It includes virtually every cost containment provision recommended by health care experts. We heard that from many of our witnesses before this committee. And yet this budget, this budget would kill many of those system-wide reforms that will reduce costs in the system. Now, interestingly, this Republican budget does preserve many of the specific Medicare reforms in the Affordable Care Act, including some of the mechanisms to slow the growth of systems and eliminate excessive taxpayer subsidies to some of the managed care companies. In fact, the bulk of the Medicare savings in this 10-year budget comes from reasonable reforms we made in the Affordable Care Act which is especially startling given the fact that during the last campaign, Democratic candidates faced a barrage of campaign attacks telling seniors we had slashed their Medicare. What is new, what is new in the Republican budget plan is the termination of Medi the Medicare guarantee for seniors. It doesn't reform Medicare, it deforms and dismantles it. It forces seniors off of Medicare and into the private insurance market. It does nothing to rein in the rising costs of health care, but transfers the bill for those rising costs to seniors. Seniors will pay more, while insurance companies stand to reap a bonanza by getting all the Medicare payroll taxes and the premiums people currently pay. If your support amount, your voucher or premium support, whatever you want to call it, is not sufficient to pay for the benefits you need, tough luck. If your doctor is not on the private plan, too bad. This Republican plan simply rations health care and choice of doctor by income at the end of the day. It also supports the safety net for seniors 
in nursing homes and assisted living facilities, as well as low-income kids 